All right, so um, here's the overview of what I want to talk about. Uh, first, talk about why measure democracy, then some measurement choices and a little overview of democracy measurement, and then uh, focus on VDEM and how it's different from, from other projects that measure democracy. And I'll give some, a couple of examples of index construction in VDEM, and then talk about various sources of data. And I, and the, I want the basic theme of this uh, address to be that there are a lot of possibilities uh, for, for you participants to recombine existing indicators in order to measure concepts that you find interesting. Uh, the possibilities have not been exhausted yet. In fact, I think the world is just opening up and there are many opportunities to measure interesting concepts. So first, uh, like, like Schultz uh, emphasized, democracy measures are used for a lot of purposes. Uh, educators and students use them to describe and compare trends in countries. Journalists and NGOs use them to describe and evaluate what's going on in the world. Researchers, um, and I think most of us are researchers, we use indicators, we need indicators to test hypotheses about the causes of democracy and consequences of democracy. And uh, probably most consequentially, and a lot of international organizations and national development agencies are now using um, democracy indicators to assess their democracy promotion programs and even to allocate funding to, to figure out which countries they consider worthy to, to receive investments. So here's a kind of an overview of democracy measurement. There are many possible ways to describe steps in measurement but I'm going to emphasize these uh, because I think they suit the purposes of, of this hackathon. Um, most importantly, is it's important to define what the master concept is that you want to measure. And then secondarily, to define it in terms of components, to break it up into a series of components uh, that define the concept. And as you do that, it's uh, it's unavoidable that you kind of have to decide on what the level of measurement is going to be uh, referring to the, the, the uh, typical categories of nominal ordinal interval and ratio level measurement because that determines not only what kinds of measures you get out of it but also how you define the concept i think uh, the the big debate about whether uh, democracy is a category uh, you know, a dichotomy or whether it's a continuous scale uh, it, at root stems from people's choices about whether they conceptualize democracy as a category or as a matter of degree. The second step is to gather data on the components, measure the components. Third, analyze the relationships among the components. Fourth, combine the components into a measure of the master concept and then validate the measure that you've produced. So I'm going to talk in a little more detail about each one of these things. So about concepts and levels of measurement, and this is kind of the evolution of the field. Uh, nominal measurement is has been the, the oldest form of doing that, uh, even consisting of uh, just listing criteria in a definition to just what, what is it that distinguishes democracies from not democracies, including, for example, the article by um, Schmitter and Carl what democracy is and is not. Uh, Seymour Martin Lipset did this and his famous APSR article. Uh, Alvarez, Shibub, Lemongi, and Jaworski uh, define their democracy dictatorship dichotomy. Uh, Bosch, Miller, and Rosado has updated that and Shibub and Gandhi uh, as well. Um, another example is typologies, which are, are nominal level, level of measurement, defining categories, beginning with Aristotle with his six regime types. Hannah Arendt and Friedrich and Brzezinski defined totalitarian regimes. Lentz expanded that to authoritarian regimes and a host of other kinds of non-democratic regimes. Uh, and following in that, uh, Geddes, Wright, and Franz uh, have their typology of different kinds of non-democratic regimes as well. But with ordinal ratings, um, there's a supposition that, that there are degrees of being democratic or something else. Uh, and this is, uh, under, has underlaid um, Freedom House's approach to this because they set out to measure freedom, not democracy, but freedom, but they defined it as consisting of political rights and civil liberties. Uh, 
polity actually started with authority structures, uh, but it overlaps, at least some of their indicators overlap with what we mean by democracy. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. Uh, with interlevel, interval level measurement, we, we tried to say not only what is the ranking of states, but also how much of a difference is there between the ranks. And so one of my earlier projects looked at uh, contestation and inclusiveness. Uh, the World Governance Institute uh, puts out a, a voice and accountability measure, which is the closest thing they have to a measure of democracy. The Economist Intelligence Unit measures democracy and also includes democratic attitudes in their measures. Um, and the democracy barometer, and uh, Merkel is here with us today, um, and I'm sure he'll talk more about that with democratic quality, so I'm not going to dwell on that, but they have several levels of measurement here. And there's one example that I that I easily think of, of ratio measurement uh, by Tatu Van Hanen, uh, who measures competition and participation in a ratio way in which there's an absolute zero on the scales for both of those things, which may, makes um, multiplication and, and division possible. Um, there, now, how do you get data? Uh, and there are many modes of data collection now. Uh, a lot of people uh, used to emphasize the collection of what was called objective data, which basically amounts to state-generated data, where the official state agencies that collect data. Um, Van Hanen relied on uh, official or objective data a lot. Um, I think Calling it objective is a misnomer because uh, much state-generated data relies on household surveys, which are basically opinion surveys, uh, you know, asking people in households about employment and things like that. And there's subjectivity built into that as well. Um, other people rely on systematic coding of textual sources. I had some early experience with that and seeing Nelly and Richards and their human rights measures uh, uh, recoded the U.S. Department of State's country reports on human rights practices. Uh, and then there are a lot of projects with that rely on expert ratings. Uh, people who know countries well uh, rate uh, how countries fit on different variables. And sometimes uh, the experts are outside observers uh, and sometimes they are people in the country uh, who probably know the country situation much better, but may have less comparative perspective. The, the kind of data collection that probably most interests this hackathon is the secondary analysis of existing quantitative data. Um, and when you have other people's quantitative data, then you can construct an index with that. There are other kinds of projects that do this in a, in a, in a more high tech way with latent variable analysis and the, the uh, unified democracy scores and the EUI and one of my earlier projects uh, also analyze democracy indicators to find what is the latent variable that they're all trying to measure. Some rather new methods involve crowdsourcing and Kenneth Benoit, who, uh, Benoit who's with us today, uh, has uh, an APSR article that does this uh, with consulting amateur raters uh, to, to, to measure democracy. Uh, and the newest entry here is machine learning, and there's an example with Grundler and, and Krieger uh, about that, which is generally machine learning of, of trying to, to uh, analyze existing democracy indicators uh, to rate countries and sort them. After gathering the data, wherever it comes from, I think it's important to analyze the data, to look at the relationship between the components some people skip this and insist that once you define the concept, the logic of that definition tells you everything you need to know about what the relationships among the components should be, and you should ignore any empirical evidence that might contradict that. But for other people, um, the approach to measurement, and I'm in this camp, we believe that good measurement depends on a good fit between the conceptual relationships that we have in our heads and the empirical relationships that are out there in the world. And from this approach, um, the logic of the concept should be regarded as a set of hypotheses that can be tested. And if, what, if the relationships that conceptually we expect to exist turn out not to exist, then we need to revise the concept so that we have a good fit between uh, 
evidence and the way we think about things. And the essential question in analyzing the data is to figure out which components move together or change together or vary it together. Um, because the components that move together can be combined to measure a more general concept with relatively little loss of information. And uh, components that move independently of one another sh probably should not be combined until you have a persuasive theoretical rationale for how to combine them. Because otherwise, you, you know, you can combine them, but what you get is that all the all the countries that are at the high have the highest ratings end up at the top of the scale and all the countries that have the lowest ratings end up at the bottom of the scale but most countries are high on some things and low on others and they all get treated uh, somewhere in the middle in a way that's not very meaningful because it's just kind of a conceptual muddle in the middle so when it comes to aggregating components there are some key choices to make and one choice that should be considered is not to aggregate, that is not to combine individual indicators to try to measure a more general concept, because that always involves some loss of information, even if it's a small loss of information. You sacrifice uh, having a measure of a very general concept, but you gain a more specific, fine-grained measure of, a more, of more specific concepts, and so often that could be the most useful thing to do. But if you're going to aggregate, then you can look at different sorts of formulas for ag aggregating and different logics that correspond to them. And I'm relying a lot here on Gary Gertz's work on uh, uh, social science concepts. Um, additive formulas have a logic that says that a high value on one component can compensate for a low value on another component. And so that adding or averaging them can be a valid way to combine them. Uh, if you don't make any assumptions about what the weights of the components are, then de facto you're applying equal weights, you're assuming equal weights. Um, but many indicators weight the components when they add them. Um, and some people base the weights on theoretical relationships. Uh, Axel Hedanius did that, Polity does that or did that, I should say. Um, and many many projects uh, use weights that are based on empirical relationships by conducting a factor analysis or confirmatory factor analysis or some more complex structural equation model uh, to use the empirical relationships to say how much each component taps into the common underlying dimension. Multiplicative formulas can be used when the contribution of component to the master concept depends on the value of other components. There's kind of an interaction among components. Um, at the extreme case, uh, you could follow a logic of the, the weakest link, as is to say that a, a country is only as democratic as its least democratic component. At the opposite, extre opposite extreme, you could say use a strongest link uh, logic to say a country is as democratic as its most democratic feature. Or you can use a whole lot of measures, a, a lot of formulas that uh, split the difference. A geometric mean multiplies things and then raises them to a fractional exponent. Um, or you can, even with a multiplicative formula, you can weight each component in the formula by raising it to a power. Um, but if you use multiplicative formulas, then it's really important to, to be aware of the effect of having zeros and negative values. Uh, because if you're multiplying things and one of the components is zero, then the entire index is going to be zero. If you have negative values and you're multiplying them by other negative values, then you're going to increase the value and make it, make it uh, a, a large positive value, which is probably the opposite of what you intend. So very often, if you're going to multiply things, it's probably necessary to, um, to transform each of the components to a zero to one scale, or at least a completely positive scale. And there are many other function, functions that can be used besides addition and multiplication. You can take logs, you can define conditional relationships, uh, you can convert things to uh, cumulative, 
cumulative distribution function or that is normalizing it. You can use roots and exponents, lots of different things, if you have a logic to justify that. And you can use a combination of several formulas if it fits a theoretically guided definition. Validation is important. Um, uh, some, it used to be that people didn't validate their data very much because it was hard to do. They didn't have much to compare it to. And people just had to assume that it was more or less correct, or they just relied on face validity. Like, I like where these countries fit on the scale, so that makes sense to me. Um, when there are better measures, it may be possible to compare things against some gold standard uh, and say it's valid to the extent that it agrees with this best measure. Uh, barring that, uh, we can compare a measure against several available standards, other measures of the same concept or, or very similar concepts, and to the extent that they agree, it's relatively valid. Uh, one could also analyze the relationship of an indicator with the expected causes and effects of that concept, um, and that is a kind of validation. And it's also possible to do something uh, that is relatively novel, but uh, to analyze the relationships of the indicators with the likely sources of systematic error and random error. Um, if, um, if we expect, for example, that um, uh, people, that, that, that uh, coders who supply data, uh, who identify with the left, uh, tend to give higher ratings to, to countries that have a left-wing government, and we find that that's true, then that raises some questions about the validity or the reliability of the indicator. Uh, we can also look at random error uh, and see how, how confident we can be that the score is within certain bounds. And so studies like that can um, help give us some information about how much we can trust the data. Now I'm going to talk some about the measurement choices that the Varieties of Democracy Project, also known as VDEM, um, have, has made. Um, and I want to first say, why pay special attention to Varieties of Democracy? Uh, I put this, this chart together yesterday um, as, as one rationale for paying attention to VDEM. Uh, the y-axis here is... Uh, a, a measure of how specific the measures are that each project has produced. And the x-axis is a measure of time, not, not when the indicators were developed, but what years, what historical years each indicator project covers. And so there are, what, 15 uh, different measurement projects here, and, I, and I've rated how many indicators they're producing as a measure of how fine-grained the project is, how many concepts they measure, and with the idea that the more indicators they're producing, the more qualitative information they're producing in addition to quantitative information about this. And uh, there are a lot of projects that uh, have measured things, uh, well, there's several projects that have measured a lot of countries since 1800. Uh, more since 1900, even more since 1950, and then in the late 80s, early 1990s, a lot of a lot more projects emerged, and they rated more and more things about democracy. And I think a real standout here is the Democracy Barometer Project, which, by one count, has produced 105 indicators to give us a lot of information. Although it's for uh, most, mostly European countries, so it doesn't cover the entire world. Um, but then when VDEM comes along, the picture changes to this because one of the things that's really distinctive about VDEM is the number of indicators we produce. Um, it's like, uh, I think the official count is 483 indicators uh, for VDEM and then about 200 for historical VDEM. So it just vastly expands. Uh, the the specificity of what we're measuring. And so I think that's advantageous because if you want to create your own index of measuring democracy or some concept related to democracy, then VDEM gives you much more information to work with than any other source does. And when you download the data set, it also includes a lot of useful indicators that come from other projects as too. So the overview, what is distinctive about VDEM? First, it recognizes not one idea of democracy, but five different 
kinds of democracy, principles or varieties of democracy. It, and second, it disaggregates these principles into dozens of indices and hundreds of indicators. So it's very fine grained measurement. Uh, and we're transparent about all the methods that we use, including the rationales for index construction. Uh, and if this is not a, a small team of people that sit in our offices in Europe and the United States and pass judgment on the rest of the world. We rely on several thousand experts, about 3,500 experts all over the world who know their countries very well. And we use a sophisticated measurement model that maximizes comparability across countries and over time. And it's not perfect, but we provide confidence intervals for all of the variables that are run through the measurement model. And Vitam has, in recent years, spun off related projects that measure other concepts that are sort of adjacent to the idea of democracy. And I'll mention those in a minute. But anyway, what is distinctive about Vitam data? First, it, it captures multiple dimensions of democracy. Um, we think electoral democracy is really the core. Like we don't want to call something democracy that's not that doesn't satisfy our requirements for electoral democracy. But uh, one way to think of this is there have been critiques of mere electoral democracy that say it's not it doesn't have some of the essential components of democracy. And, and so we recognize these other schools of thought that have long intellectual, philosophical and political pedigrees. Uh, so we recognize liberal democracy that says that uh, we don't want to just elect a dictator every four or five years. Uh, we, we, there have to be checks and balances. From the executive, from from the courts, and from the legislature, and also constitutional guarantees of, of civil liberties uh, to protect democracy. Another critique emphasizes uh, e social and economic equality, saying that people cannot enjoy their full rights as citizens unless they have a roof over their heads and enough food to eat and access to education. Uh, that there has to be a certain amount of equality before people can enjoy uh, citizenship. Uh, participatory democracy says it's not enough to just allow people to cast a vote every few years. Uh, there have to be other channels for participation, uh, whether it's through hearings or primaries or street demonstrations and protest. Uh, those things are, or direct mechanisms of direct democracy that, particip that adds a dimension to democracy. And then there's a school of thought with deliberative democracy that says that, that uh, leaders have to earn their authority to command obedience by engaging in respectful deliberation with citizens and just providing reasons for what they're doing. Um, so we implement this um, by uh, disaggregating the idea of democracy. First, we identify five different kinds of democracy, these varieties or principles of democracy liberal, participatory, deliberative, egalitarian, and electoral democracy. And we define each, well, four of these types as a combination of electoral democracy and a specific component, like a liberal component, participatory component, etc. But the disaggregation doesn't stop there. For example, if we look at electoral democracy, we break that down into its components, which we, like following Dahl's uh, idea of polyarchy, we define this as clean elections, elected officials, freedom of association, freedom of expression, and media, and extent of the suffrage. And we can further break down these components of electoral democracy into uh, a couple dozen indicators. Uh, and I'm not going to go through that entire list, but we use multiple indicators to measure each of the components of electoral democracy, which is a component of each of the five, five types of democracy. For deliberative democracy, it's a simpler structure because we have only five subcomponents of deliberative democracy. For egalitarian, for the egalitarian component, we have subcomponents of equal distribution of resources and equal protection of the laws, and each one of those has uh, several indicators. For the liberal component, we distinguish among equality before the law and individual liberty judicial constraints on the executive, legislative constraints on the executive, and those in turn can be broken down into uh, a, a larger number of specific indicators. And for the participatory component, uh, uh, we have civil society participation, the direct popular vote index, uh, 
uh, and indicators of local government and regional government. And those can be further broken down into a large number, like the really large number for the direct popular vote index was uh, constructed by David Altman uh, at the Catholic University of Chile. And he collects those data himself. But anyway, what's the relationship? What's the result of all of this disaggregation and then reassembling these things into measures of high level uh, varieties of democracy? Well, these five varieties, electoral, liberal, participatory, egalitarian, and delivered democracy are all highly correlated with one another. And they're strongly correlated because they all contain electoral democracy. So you know, they're partly the same thing with some variations. In practice, the variations can be pretty large, but overall, over a long range of possible measures, they're, they're strongly correlated with one another. But the more you disaggregate it, the less correlated the disaggregated indicators are. So here are relationships uh, between clean elections, the liberal component, the participatory component, the egalitarian component, and the deliberative component, excluding the electoral democracy index. And we can see that uh, these things are much less strongly correlated with one another. Uh, they're, they're more disaggregated and, dis and distinct, and therefore they, they give us different information about aspects of democracy. And then if you disaggregate all the way to our most specific indicators, this is just eight out of hundreds, um, but these specific indicators vary somewhat independently. It, like if they all measured the same thing, or very similar things. When one line goes up, other lines would go up. They, these lines would all track each other in the same way, but they don't. Uh, they move in different ways, uh, and you find uh, really distinctive things. For example, you find in China that there is uh, a moderately high rating for executive respect for the Constitution. In Ghana, you have uh, in the colonial era, and we do rate colonial years, uh, which is also a distinctive feature, um, that there was under British rule relatively high, uh, strong independence of the of the high court. In the United States, despite being very democratic in a lot of ways, uh, before the 1960s, the U.S. gets a very low rating on social group equality and respect for civil liberties and so on. But anyway, there's a lot of variance. There's a lot of diversity among these very specific indicators. And when you mash them together to measure more general concepts, then you lose some of this variance. And in fact, uh, if you look at the 61 indicators that go into our major concepts, uh, when you aggregate them into the five component indices, then 36% of the variance in the specific indicators is lost. So there's some advantages in not aggregating. So I'll give you examples of index construction, um, and I'm going to distinguish here between constructing a unidimensional index and constructing a multidimensional index. A unidimensional index is one in which all the components are strongly correlated with one another, so they can be combined in a way that doesn't lose very much information. But if it's multidimensional, information would necessarily be lost if they were simply added or averaged together. So uh, one index that we have is the Freedom of Expression and Alternative Sources of Information Index, uh, which is uh, part of the Electoral Democracy Index. And here are the uh, eight indicators that are aggregated into this. And this is a, a Bayesian factor analysis. Um, and if you look at the loadings on each indicator, they're all very high, all over 0.8, and they're all very similar. That is, all of these measures from uh, press censorship to academic and cultural expression and media bias and media perspectives, they're all very similar. And that's telling you that these are all measuring very similar concepts, that all these different aspects of freedom of expression uh, are closely related to each other. So we can safely combine them as a weighted average without losing too much information. And so we can measure the more general concept of freedom of expression and media by combining these eight indicators, and it works very well. But if you look at the, the five components of the electoral democracy index, we've got uh, 
elected officials, clean elections, freedom of association, suffrage, and freedom of expression in media. These things are not nearly as closely associated with the other with, with each other. So freedom of association and clean elections are pretty well associated. Uh, clean elections and freedom of expression are pretty well associated and freedom of association and freedom of expression are very closely associated, uh, correlation of 0.928. But other things are not, like the correlation between clean elections and suffrage is only 0.183. Um, basically, you would lose a lot of information and get a, a meaningless mess if you tried to just average those two things together. So there has to be some logic to deciding how to combine these five different things into an overall measure of, of polyarchy or electoral democracy. And if we, if we use a multiplicative formula, that is multiply the five components together, it's, it's it's a very it penalizes any country for any low score it has on any of the five components and so here's the distribution of scores on a multiplicative polyarchy index there's so many that are zero or very close to zero and you can hardly even see the ones that have scores that are above 0.5 but there are a few if you use an additive formula to combine them then it's much more forgiving of a low score on one component or even two components and other components where their high scores can compensate for low scores on other things so if you if you add or average these scores you get a much uh a much broader distribution much flatter distribution on the polyacrid score but we and here's the relationship between these two things here's the multiplicative index and the additive index and the, I mean, this doesn't show you how much the scores are concentrated on zero on the multiplicative thing, just this line is zero here. But there is uh, a range of things here, which is a, a nonlinear function that relates these two things together. And in, in VDEM, we decided, um, and this is a committee decision, and it's not the only possible decision. I'm not confident that it's the best possible decision, but it's the one that we eventually decided after more than a year of intense deliberation, that there's a rationale for an additive index saying that, um, that there should be some compensation among things. And my favorite example of this is Liechtenstein, uh, which has a lot of freedom of expression. It's got party competition, it's got a legislature, uh, has broad suffrage since 1984 at least, uh, but uh, the chief executive is not elected. There's uh, the, the Prince Regnant of Liechtenstein is the chief executive, and he's, he's, a he's a hereditary monarch, and he has significant power. So if that one component would bring Liechtenstein way, way down uh, on his score. Um, but we think that uh, some of the other things should partially compensate for that. On the other hand, there's a valid logic to a multiplicative index that says that, for example, um, having a broad suffrage in the elections doesn't matter much if there is only one party that people are allowed to vote for, as in the approval elections that the Soviet Union used to hold. Um, so that logic makes sense, too. And so we decided to split the difference and give half of the weight to a multiplicative index and half the weight to the additive index. And we end up with the, the distribution at the lower right corner here. And this is our polyarchy index that, that does these two things. And here's the math for this. It's just half multiplicative, half additive. And if you break it down, it's half the product of these five components and half uh, a weighted average of these components, which roughly corresponds to their loadings uh, in a factor analysis, but also it gives more weight to the behavioral uh, indicators, clean elections, association, and expression, and about half the weight to ha half as much weight to elected official and suffrage, which are formal uh, measures. Then we're, when we combine the electoral democracy index or polyarchy, with the specific com principal components. Uh, we use uh, also a combination of an additive and a multiplicative formula. And we also raise polyarchy to a certain exponent that, that makes um, the index equal to 0.5 when polyarchy is 0.5 and the other component is equal to one. 
uh, and we use that for all the other indices as well. And the, the result of this is something like this. This is a three-dimensional graph. I hope it can be somewhat read. This is the egalitarian democracy index. So we have the, the electoral or polyarchy index here going from zero to one as you go to the back. And the egalitarian component goes from zero to one as you go left to right. And the result of combining these things with this formula is the egalitarian democracy index on the vertical dimension. And so you have uh, countries can score high on the egalitarian democracy index only if they're high on both the egalitarian component and polyarchy. So we get France, United Kingdom, Switzerland up here. The United States rates a little bit lower there because we're not so great on the egalitarian component. On the other hand, you get Cuba, which rates very high on the egalitarian component, but very low on electoral democracy. And so its overall score is fairly low. At the other extreme, you've got, uh, say, Peru, their rates real, rates very high on electoral democracy in, in certain years, um, but low on egalitarian components, so it pays a penalty for that. So this is how that, for, that's a consequence of this formula. When you download VDEM data set, um, it may be confusing at first because we also give different versions of each one of our variables that goes through the measurement model. And I, and I think it's important to clarify that. So the variables, like the version of each variable that has no suffix to it, there's no underscore and something after that, um, is the, like the, the data that comes straight out of the measurement model. And that is measured basically in sort of equivalent of z-scores. Um, and that's the version that I would recommend that people use. But we also include in the data set other versions of the data. So some people like to use a version of the data that corresponds to the categories written in our code book. And so that's an ordinal scale. Um, and that has a suffix ORD. There's uh, a combination of these two things, original scale OSP, uh, that has fractional, mem fractional uh, scores between categories, and it's on that original scale. We also have versions that end in NR that are the number of coders per country uh, on that variable in that year. And we also have a mean, which is just a simple mean of coder answers per country year. And there are also some n-cotomies, uh, like uh, the, the continuous data divided into three categories, four categories, or five categories, which I personally don't use at all. Um, but here's why I would recommend the measurement model version of the data, the one without a suffix, because it contains more precise quantitative information, even though its interpretation is less straightforward. So here's a comparison of the measurement model version of the um, the respect for counter arguments variable. So on this x-axis, we have all the continuous scores for countries um, on this. And then on the y-axis, it's the same variable, but converted to the ordinal version. So it has the scores zero through five, which correspond to the codebook definitions of the, of the uh, survey questions that people answered. But it's, uh, you know, it, it confines the answers to small categories and doesn't take advantage of the, the measurement model version of this that um, provides more precise coding of this. Anyway, um, the, the five major indices and the components and subcomponents that comprise them are not the only indices that VDM has produced. We also have produced indices that measure things that are related to democracy, but are not exactly democracy, uh, like the civil society index, party system institutionalization, political corruption, women's political empowerment, rule of law, clientelism, three different kinds of accountability, division of power, uh, national, regional, local, uh, exclusion by gender, urban rural residents and political and social social economic group, neo-patrimonial rule, party institutionalization. I guess I have that twice. At any rate, um, and then there have been recent spin-off projects from VDEM that measure even more concepts. The Digital Society Project um, uh, looks at different aspects of social media uh, and how that, that are relevant for democracy. The V Party 
um, spinoff has data not about, well, about countries, but about p specific political parties within each country in each election year, uh, and has party level data on ideology and anti-pluralism and populism. We have also a pandemic backsliding project, uh, the civic and ac academic space, um, variables. There, there are a bunch of variables. There's a couple, well, I think three dozen variables. Uh, that measure a lot of things about civil society, uh, including polarization. Those are some very good measures. And also measures of legitimation. That is, what are the formulas on which governments base their legitimacy following Weberian criteria for that? If you want further documentation about it, uh, we have a 2020 book that tells you more than you would ever want to know about the project, its history, how we collect the data, the measurement model, the validation, index construction, everything is in there. Uh, the code book uh, you get when you download the data, it's 432 pages with uh, excruciatingly detailed information about all of the variables in the data collection and a series of other uh, documents about methodology, how we compare to other indicators, how we define countries, how the project is organized, uh, and then a lot of working papers and some country reports and country briefs and other things that use the data to say things about the world. And I also want to say that, of course, there's more data out there than just VDEM. There are many uh, valuable projects that measure things that VDEM does not measure um, and that you may find useful if, if you're interested in particular things. And I, I'm just giving a list here. And some of the representatives of these projects are here with us today and they will say things about that. But there are things about constitutions, about elections, corruption, uh, political institutions, war, globalization, turnout, uh, you know, all kinds of things um, that could be measured. So I'm going to stop there.